if for instance let's talk about there's a child a story about a child that the, the mother so it's December the mother's already paid for the holiday and she wants the child to take the child on holiday father had initially agreed and now all of a sudden because they had an argument he now refuses for the mother to take the child out of the country on holiday so the the court um, now has to consider whether it will grant an order for her to go out, and court, uh, out on the holiday so of course she would be able to she could if she comes in the ordinary court she could probably claim back all those expenses that she has paid but that is not necessarily in the, in the form of damages or whatever. So that is not necessarily always the only issue that the court looks at. So here now the situation would be, <coughs> there's this opportunity now that is lost, obviously, of the holiday. They can't go on, they won't be able to go on the holiday anymore. So that's what you will have, because it's a very simple example, but that shows you that it's not necessarily about, if you are able to claim damages later on, then you would have substantial redress. And, and what the authorities say is that that is not necessarily always considered to be substantial redress. So you weigh, it's a whole balancing of the interests of the two parties that takes place. Um, and you know, it's from the one case to the next, it could have a different result because it's a very discretionary issue also, um, which the court, that's what we are going to discuss now is that Deciding whether or not to hear a matter on an urgent basis is a discretion that the court exercises. So there are guiding principles, but um, one judge may say, may, might have said it's urgent, whilst another judge would say, no, it's not urgent. Same facts, same issues, whatever. Um, but it, it generally, you would want to hope, you would hope that, that there would be some consistency, but it's not necessarily always the case. Um, okay, so um, if you look at the rule, the way it's phrased, you're coming, uh, you're basically coming to the court. It's it's similar to uh, an application for condemnation, application for postponement, in the sense that it is by its nature you are coming to ask the court for an indulgence. So. Um, as the applicant, you have to satisfy the court that you are entitled to that indulgence. And that's where the, those requirements come in. And that's where the court now has the discretion, and because that, that's what the rule says. The rule says the court may. Okay? That gives the court the discretion. So it's all <coughs> deciding whether to hear matter on an urgent basis is a discretionary one, which must, the discretion which must be ex exercised judicially and fairly taking into account also the interests of both parties, balancing those different interests. But these, these cases that I cite here are cases that will assist you in, in looking at how the court exercises its discretion uh, when considering the question of urgency. Um, so if you come to court, obviously, and you ask only for interim relief, it is easier for the court to, to grant that interim relief because um, the other party might uh, will then have an opportunity to, to come and properly put their case before the court. But if you come on, a very, on very short notice and you want final relief, the court will be more reluctant to grant the, 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 the relief you're seeking on an urgent basis. Um, and this is really about um, fairness between the parties, making sure that when you give an order of a final nature, the other party has had an opportunity to pre present their case properly. Um, so, and, and this is why you, the applicant also has to make a very good judgment call as to the timing of his application, how long it takes to come to court, the, the amount of notice he gives to the, the respondent, and also how he phrases the relief that he seeks. So the, the shorter the notice, um, the more important it is for you to rather ask for interim relief pending uh, other proceedings or pending finalization of the application or whatever, um, rather than asking for final relief on that day. 
because then your chances of succeeding if you give le l very little notice are slim whereas if you come to court on very short notice and you ask for interim relief your chances of succeeding is actually much better it's also much better because of the way in which the court <coughs> approaches the question as to whether you should be granted the relief or not and that's i will be dealing with that in a short while so in essence where is final relief the matter is if you want to put it sim very simply, the matter is actually decided on the respondent's version. If you are asking for interim relief, it's really decided on the applicant's version. That's a very simple and basic way of putting it. But there's, it's, uh, it's, there's a, lot of, uh, a bit more of an <laughs> a, a bit more to it. Don't, don't take that down now. I'll explain you the, the approach just now. Um, but basically, if the relief that you are seeking is interim in nature, in essence, the decision is taken based on the version that you as the applicant have put forward. If it's of a final nature, the court makes a decision based on the version that's put forward by the respondent. It's not that simple, but in the end, if I, if I explain to you this process of, of looking at the evidence, then you'll understand why I say so. So it's better for you to come to court seeking interim relief in the event that you are coming there on a, on a much shorter notice period, okay, as opposed to coming and asking for final relief. So when the court is deciding the question of urgency, and this really trips a lot of people up, <laughs> this approach. When the court, the court is deciding the question of urgency, the court must assume that the applicant is entitled to the relief he is seeking, the main relief, that which is in the notice of motion in terms of saying, um, I want an interdict stopping this person from selling the car. You don't look at whether or not that person has already now satisfied the requirements of, for that interdict. You assume that the person is entitled to an interdict in deciding whether to hear the matter urgently or not. Because at that point in time, it's not about the merits of the case. It's about whether or not this person should be heard urgently or not. So what you will look at is how the, the urgency arose, what the applicant has done in order to try and get things sorted and whatever what was the respondent's response? And does the applicant not have a choice? Because if they wait, then they will lose out at the end of the day. Okay. So it's not about whether now, at this point in time, when you are considering urgency, whether or not the interdict itself will succeed or not. That's why you will find that sometimes a case will be heard urgently, but the person might lose on the merits. And you will find sometimes the court will not hear you on urgency, but you might succeed on the merits at the end of the day. When I say merits, I'm talking about the, the, the main application, the application asking for certain relief. Can I move on to the next slide? Remember I said to you, as soon as the situation that arises that gives rise to an urgent matter, you have to come to court as soon as possible after that. And I say as soon as possible after that because the court does obviously consider what you do in, in between to determine whether you were acting negligently or irresponsibly in, uh, in taking too long to come to court. So. If the matter arises, if the urgency or the, the, the situation happens today and you wait until a month from now and you bring an application on one, one day's notice, it's going to count against you unless you can provide a very good explanation for that month of inactivity. What the court also considers is how much time you afforded yourself to prepare your application and how much time you afforded the respondent to answer to your application. You must also, as the applicant, must also be fair in how you do, how you do that. So 
You can't sit for a whole month and draft your papers for a whole month and then you give the respondent two days notice. Why should that person be prejudiced? So those are, are all things that the court will take into account. So self-created urgency, yes. Now the matter is urgent when the matter is being heard in court. But it's self-created and for that reason I am not going to grant you the relief or I'm not going to hear you on an urgent basis. That's ultimately the result where you are not diligent in coming to court with your matter. So what the court basically is saying is that you could have come to court sooner. Uh, that would have made it a little bit more convenient for me as the court because then I have enough time to properly consider the matter, to organize my role, and it would also have given the respondent enough time to also deal with your application. And it would mean that I have proper papers before me to actually decide on this matter properly. So, um, the court will obviously, as I said, will look at what you have done in the time that it took you to come to court to determine whether you were dilatory or whether what you have been doing was reasonable under the circumstances um, and that you, you didn't act negligently in taking the time that you did to come to court. So the following is this test that uh, was <coughs> even in the case of, um, yeah, the case name is Radebe, but let's go back there. So what is considering, sorry, when re re considering what a reasonable time is to launch proceedings, one has to have regard to the reasonable time required to take all reasonable steps prior to and in order to initiate those review proceedings. So, such steps include steps taken to ascertain the terms and effect of the decision sought to be reviewed, to ascertain the reasons for the decision, to consider and take advice from lawyers and other experts where it is reasonable to do so, to make representations where it is reasonable to do so, to attempt to negotiate an acceptable compromise before resorting to litigation, to obtain copies of relevant documents, to consult with possible deponents, and to obtain affidavits from them, to obtain real evidence where applicable, to obtain and place the attorney in funds, to prepare the necessary papers, and to lodge and serve those papers. Now, this was said in the context of a review, what I was reading now, but it applies equally with an urgent application. Which case is that? It's this Radebe case. Mm. So basically what the court is saying is you're not expected to just run to court without preparing properly or come to court with a, a, a bad case because you didn't take the time to do what you needed to in order to put a proper case before the court. Um, it says that it is reasonable for you to take advice on the issue. It's reasonable for you to try and negotiate a solution with the other party. So often you will find that a party will first send a letter to the other, uh, other side and, and ask for an undertaking and say, um, give us an undertaking that you will not proceed with the, with the sale of the vehicle and if you don't give us an undertaking, then we will bring an urgent application. Because that it might very well be that the other side says, okay, fine, I know, I see now you are intending to bring an application to stop me in, in the sense of um, having this dispute of ours re resolved. So I will give you an undertaking. I won't sell the car until this matter of ours has been resolved. It happens a lot. So is that like a gentleman's agreement between the two parties without the court? Yes. Yes. So even before you've started with drafting the papers or anything, very often people will seek an undertaking from the other side, especially when there is a bit of time for such activity to take place. Sometimes there's not enough time to do that. But, or even when, when time is pressing, it sometimes is the best thing to do. So when, when individuals are busy fighting with each other, 
they might not have that sensibility to actually uh, try and resolve their issue in court and say, okay, I won't go on with what I'm planning to do until we've resolved the issue in court. But once a lawyer comes on board, you might find that the lawyer advises the client, listen, let's just give the undertaking, let's get this thing resolved, and then if you succeed, then you can go away with your thing without having to incur the costs of an urgent application now as well. So you will then, then sense sort of prevails, good sense uh, prevails then. So that is normally what, the, what you would do um, as, a, as an applicant who intends to bring an urgent application. You'll first try and resolve it on an amicable basis. And of course, still bring your proceedings in the normal course. Absolutely, because um, if the appeal has the effect of staying the judgment, it doesn't always. Um, it depends on the case, but in most cases it would, staying the effect of the judgment. Then, and the other party persists in, in executing, they would actually be acting unlawfully. Um, and in those circumstances, if the threat is real, then you can, that, that, is an op that is a proper time actually to come on an urgent basis, especially if that person is intending to act sooner rather than later. Because then otherwise, you know, but what would the effect be of your appeal at the end of the day? It would be useless for you. No, I don't think the court can do that. So that happens by law, but by also by the nature of the case that you are dealing with. So in labor matters, for instance, I know it doesn't stay execution when an arbitrator has given an award. By law, it does not stay execution. So you have to come to court in, uh, and ask for the stay of, of execution of that arbitration award. Um, and then there's other cases, because of the nature of the case or the relief that is sought or granted, it would not result in a stay of, the, of any, anything. So um, if you want to um, have a stay, then you have to ask for a stay. Um, you can also come and ask for the court order to be put in effect pending the appeal. You just have to give security most of the time. So normally, if you are appealing, you would not give effect to the award, um, unless you do so ill under uh, conditions where you are ill-advised. But you wouldn't ordinarily, you would not be giving or acting in accordance with an award whilst you have decided to appeal the matter. You would rather ask for a stay, um, or you just wouldn't do it, and then you'll wait for the other party to to try and uh, to see what the other party does, whether it does execute or not, uh, and then you decide what you're going to do going forward. <coughs> or you can pay and reserve your rights, obviously. That's another way of dealing with it. So what parties sometimes do is that they pay the money into trust, pending the appeal, instead of asking for a uh, stay, they agree that the money will not be released until the appeal is finalized. But that's all part of the process of trying to settle the thing prior, uh, before going to court on an urgent basis. Okay. Um, so you understand the concept of the court will look at whether the actions of the applicant were reasonable and the time that is spent on those actions was reasonable in order for him to be able to present his case properly. So you must be able to consult with a legal practitioner and take advice. You might, be, you might think that it's a good case and whatever, and then you come to court and then it's not a good case. So it might be good, a better idea for you to rather get proper advice on the issue before you come to court. Um, here we come to the question that you had asked about what substantial redress is the hearing in due course means. And um, that issue, often the people just say, I will not be afforded substantial redress in, in due course. But they don't say why. They don't explain, because that is a conclusion. Remember we talked about this when we talked about what must be in affidavits? You have to give the facts that support that conclusion that you want to, re to, to, to be reached. So, just saying that, that um, 
you will not be afforded substantial redress at a hearing in due course. It's not going to help you. That's why the courts often talk about they've only paid, they've paid mere lip service to that requirement. And these are cases in which those that was said, you can go read with to yourself. Um, it'll give you a good, pretty good understanding of uh, of the issue. That pretty much deals with urgent applications. Everybody, I think, has that impression at first <laughs> until you actually have to come to court with an urgent application. Those things gave me anxious nights and days and whatever because I never, you, I didn't like urgent applications because you had that impression of it has to be in court tomorrow. Now I have to sit and draft these papers. First, I must understand what the case is. I must draft these papers, especially as a junior. You, you're so afraid because you want to look at your things like a hundred times and now you have this urgent case that must go to court and you, what if you make a mistake what do you leave out something so no it's not about it must be done yesterday <laughs> no the parties come to court the, uh, because the matter is set down on a specific day so they will go on that day that it's set down for argument. So if they haven't reached an agreement as to extra timelines prior to the date of the hearing, then the respondent will go to court on that day and ask for the extra time from the court. And the court will invariably grant it. Unless really from the papers it seems that this thing has to be heard on an urgent basis. On that time. Yeah, then the, if the parties agree beforehand, they must actually inform the judge that the, uh, the matter won't be argued on that morning. We, we, we want to come back on a different day. So they'll inform the judge beforehand um, that, they, that they're not, no longer coming on Tuesday. They now have agreed on these timelines, and they'll come back on Friday morning. So they, you, they have to tell the judge before the, if they agree things before the time. But otherwise, it will come, they'll come the day that this matter is supposed to be heard, then, then, then they'll ask for time or whatever they want to do. And then they'll agree on times, timelines, and stuff like that. The court will look at, was this application served? Is it likely that this person received notice of the application? Especially if it was served personally on this person, um, it will look at that. If it was served personally and the person is not even in court, um, the court will consider whether the, the applicant is entitled to interim relief because you cannot grant an order. Uh, uh, you can't, in, 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 in this kind of scenario, you cannot grant a final order against somebody who has, who's not in court, even though he might have been served. You don't know why they didn't come to court, even though they received the order. So you will give them time. Um, and you'll issue a rule nisi, which might have might be of immediate effect, but the other, and then you'll give a date on which the parties must return to court, and the respondent must then come and show cause, which basically just means that they must file papers. They must file their papers, and the other party then files their applying papers, and then the court can hear the parties on the matter on all sets of papers, and then the order the final order can be granted. But otherwise, if the, if the respondent is not there, the court will not grant the order. So sometimes um, what the judge will also do is um, they will look at the servants and say, but you could have done, so I can give you an example. The person served, the respondent lives in Ventuk. The applicant knows exactly where the respondent lives. The issue concerns something happened that happened on a farm. And previously, they were able to serve papers on the person at the farm. But they know this person is full-time employed and whatever, and, and is actually in the do. So they go and try and serve the papers on the farm. And you wonder, but why? <laughs> it's closer in Ventuk. And so um, you ask, now, did you try and serve in Ventuk? Why could you not serve? And the person has no answer then you can say is the judge at that point in time. No, I'm not going to hear you now. Try and serve in Ventuk first. And, and there was lawyers involved. They were just fighting the whole time. So the person also knew I'm like, so you ask now, why did you also not serve it on the lawyers at least then? 
Um, because remember the rule says that the court may dispense with the forms and service. So normally you would serve on the person personally, not on the lawyer, unless the lawyer has consent from the client to receive the papers on behalf of the client. But at least if you serve the papers on the lawyer, it will come to the person's attention. Because the lawyer can then say, yes, yeah, an urgent application. Now you don't do even that. Then the court can say, no, I want you to first try and serve this on the person here in Ventuk, and then, and then I will hear you uh, together with this order. And then they go, they go and they serve, and guess what? Next day the respondent is there with their lawyer and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, as a judge, you need to make sure that the, whatever the applicant is doing is also fair to the respondent, because you can't prejudice the respondent simply because the applicant thinks their case is so urgent they must be heard quickly. So that's why it's a very dis it's a discretionary thing. You must you must apply your discretion fairly and reasonably, fair to both parties, not just the applicant, and try and protect the respondent's rights as much as possible because they, um, they are at the mercy of the applicant and the timelines and things that the applicant has determined. So the court must be convinced that whatever the applicant has done, the, the inability to, to comply with the rules to the extent that they have done, is justified in the circumstances. That's what you need to consider. So they must explain all of that. So you must be able to explain to me why did you try and serve on the farm and not in Ventuk? Did you try and find the person in Ventuk first? No. Then why must I hear you then without that person being here? Could so you just have it stand down or you, yes, you, you stand it down. Yeah, you stand it down and you say, go and serve the person first. Sometimes the applicant will come to court with that request um, because they know that they, although they might be able to serve, the notice that they are giving the other side is very short, so the other side might, have time, might not have time to properly consider the matter and file papers and that kind of thing. Um, or you as the judge, because the other party, although served, does not show up, and but you are satisfied that there was sufficient service under the circumstances and that the matter is urgent for you, urgent enough for, for, for an interim order, then you will give a rule NISA as a judge. The, the applicant has clearly abandoned this case. <laughs> He'll have to come back and explain why he was not there. There might be a reason, something might happen. But they can still set it down, eh? Yes, they can still set it down. They can even set it down on an urgent basis, yes. But obviously they'll have to come and explain why they were not there and what happened and so on. Yeah, the question is whether the person served, can I give a rule nice? Even if the person wasn't served, you will then have to decide, is the matter so urgent for, for me to grant that you will not give a final order, you will give a rule nice for me to grant a rule nice um, in the circumstances. But obviously, at that point in time, you only have the applicant's version. The respondent then can then, um, on is it 24 hours notice, they can anticipate the return day. So I might hear the case today, and I say that the respondent must show cause on, what's today, the 17th? I'm saying the respondent must show cause on the 1st of December, why these orders must not be made final, and the respondent instead of, because I've now made an interim order which is effective immediately pending the return date. So that order will be carried out. So the respondent says he doesn't want the order to be carried out, he didn't get service or he got service but um, he only came to know about it after the order was already given because service can be effected anywhere, not necessarily personally, not anywhere but on the, the rule says where you can do that. And then the respondent can give notice, 24 hours notice, to anticipate the rule, meaning that he comes back, comes to court to argue the matter. Instead of waiting for 1 December, he gives 24 hours notice and say, no, I want to be in court within 24 hours, which would take us to Sunday or whatever, or Monday or Tuesday, whatever.
because he doesn't want that rule Naza to to still stand until 1 December. And then when the respondent comes, for instance, on that 24 hours notice, he, then the court listens to the parties and realizes, oh, actually the applicant's story was not as great as I thought because I only had his version. And then he discharges the rule Naza. And at that point in time, the court will also consider urgency when the respondent comes. So the respondent can come and also argue that the matter was not that urgent. And then the court can discharge the rule uh, on the grounds that, it's, that the matter wasn't urgent. And then you can set down the matter in the ordinary course or whatever you want to do. It did, but remember the court didn't have the respondent's version. So the, it's only on the applicant's version that it considered urgency, and at that stage, okay. on that version alone, it okay. might be, seem urgent. But when the respondent comes, the respondent places other facts before the court, which says to the court, either this person um, caused his own delay, is responsible for, for, his own ur for this urgency, self-created urgency, or actually the matter is not that urgent because the respondent hasn't done anything that threatens his rights, or was not planning to do anything to threaten his rights, then, then that is destroyed. Then the court will say, no, you were not, never entitled to this relief, actually, on, even on an interim basis. <coughs> so those are the requirements for a final interdict. So you must satisfy the court that you have a clear right, um, that there is an apprehension of irreparable harm, and that you will not have any that you don't have any alternative adequate relief. So your right may arise from a contract. It may arise by law, by statute. It may arise from delict. It may arise from all the other causes of action that we, we know about. But it must be, you must establish that right clearly. So you must prove that right. Let's use the example of an agreement of sale of immovable property. So I bought a house from Nelly. I have paid her. And Nelly, uh, uh, Charlotte comes to Nelly and says, I want this house so badly. I'll pay you 100000 more than what Natasha paid you. And Nelly then decides to cancel my agreement with her and then enter into an agreement with Charlotte. Then I, and then this, she now rushes to, to, to a legal practitioner in order, or to a conveyancer to get this property transferred because once it's transferred, it's not necessarily going to be so easy for me to get that house because with um, property transfers, there's, there's a thing of um, the underlying agreement. If there's nothing wrong with that underlying agreement, then this transfer will not be set aside. So the court doesn't necessarily look at the fact that um, Nelly and I had a prior agreement, um, unless Charlotte knew of our agreement already or whatever. So. Um, then I go to court on an urgent basis, but I want a final interdict. I don't necessarily want an interim interdict, and I come, but I have to come and prove to the court I have a clear right. So I have to satisfy the court I have this agreement that is in writing. It's a valid, it was a valid agreement. I paid Nelly, and in spite of that, although I'm entitled to the transfer of the property, Nelly wants now to transfer the property to Charlotte. So I have established my right. I have it attached the agreement of sale. Everything is perfect. There's nothing wrong with what I've done. Nelly has no answer to give to the court as to why she says I do not have a right to have the property transferred in my name. So I can come to court and I can ask for an order compelling Nelly to sign all the documents necessary in order to give effect to the agreement. So that is Oh, it is specific performance that I'm seeking, but it's also interdictory relief in the sense that it's she's being forced to do something. Um, so interdicts can also come in the form of stopping somebody from doing 
something, so it's a prohibitory interdict. Spoliation applications, those are also forms of, it's also a form of an interdict. It's just got slightly different requirements because they, it's got its own special requirements. What else? So you will either interdict somebody from re to refrain from doing something or that you will interdict <coughs> them to do something. So you'll have, it's mandatory interdicts and prohibitory interdicts. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So an interdict is only appropriate where future injury is feared. So if the injury that you are talking about has already happened, it's now in the past, Nelly has already transferred the house to Charlotte, then an interdict will not be appropriate. So it must either have already happened, oh sorry, it must either uh, be something that will happen or although it has happened, it continues. So for instance, um, let's use the example of a strike. My striking employees, they have damaged property in, during the strike at the office, but they have not stopped. They continue to cause damage to, to the property or they continue to prohibit my customers from coming into my business in order for my, you know, to come and buy whatever I'm selling. So they've already stopped people, but they are still doing it, then it's okay. But if they have done it, they have already damaged the property, but they are now no longer doing it, then the interdict will not be appropriate anymore. So you have to show that it's either something that you fear will happen in the future or it's something which has already happened, but it continues. So you have a reasonable apprehension that it will be repeated also. When we talk about injury, it's not just physical injury, as in the, um, assault and that kind of stuff. It's not just physical injury or physical injury to your car or your house or whatever. It has to do with anything that infringes with whatever right you are trying to protect through the interdict. So your injury with the house story is your right to, to get transfer. Um, and if Nelly transfers to Charlotte, then that would be an infringement of my right in terms of that contract that we have signed. It's got a much wider interpretation than what we normally talk about when we talk about injury. So when we talk about alternative remedy frequently, then the response would be that you will anyway be entitled to claim damages. So yeah, I can claim damages from Nelly for, for the house that she's transferred, but that's not necessarily always considered as adequate, as an ad adequate alternative remedy. So it will all depend on the case, whether damages might be an adequate remedy under the circumstances. I know this, it's, it doesn't really sort of explain it properly. Um, but once you read the cases, then you'll give, get a better understanding of what is meant with that. Um, and it's really, I don't want to say a judgment call, but pretty much you look at the facts and you consider whether the damages in the circumstance of this case would be an adequate alternative remedy, or it wouldn't. So the applicant must satisfy you on that. Okay, um, now we get to how, where the court has to make a decision on the papers um, despite there being a factual dispute. Okay, remember we discussed if there's a dispute that arises, the court can either refer to oral evidence or go to trial or dismiss the application, but the court can also hear the matter on the, on the papers as they are and decide whether or not to grant relief. Okay. 
So where the applicant is seeking final relief on applica in application and a dispute of fact arises, the court can grant a final order if they first look at what is the, the applicant said, which is admitted by the respondent. So common cause facts. If you take those facts together with the facts alleged by the respondent, which the applicant cannot deny, would that still meet the requirements that the applicant needs to prove for the relief that it wants? Okay. So there's a cause of action. You need to know what are the requirements for whatever relief the applicant wants. To, so under what circumstances can you grant that relief? You need to know that. Then you look at the facts alleged by the parties, that which the plaintiff applicant has said and the respondent has admitted. So that is common cause now between the parties. And you take that together with what the respondent has alleged in addition to what the plaintiff applicant has said. And then you consider whether that would justify a final order, or what would that, whether that still meets the requirements of uh, the cause of action. It's plaintiff, are the applicant then still entitled to the relief on those facts? You really literally have to sit with the affidavits and make that assessment and determine what is common cause. What has the respondent said in addition? And then you take those facts together and see, is the applicant entitled to the relief on these papers? And that's why I say the case is in a final, where there's final relief sought, it's actually decided on the respondent's case. Yes, this is what I wanted to add. So what, you might, what the court must also be careful about and we discussed this already, is does the denials by the respondent give rise to a real dispute? So, first of all, the, the facts that have been admitted, okay, of the applicant's case, then the court in, in Plascon said that in certain cases, the denial by the respondent of a fact alleged by the applicant may not be such as to raise a real, genuine, or bona fide dispute of fact. If in such a case the respondent has not availed himself of the right to apply for the deponent's concern to be called for cross-examination, and the court is satisfied as to the inherent credibility of the applicant's factual averment, it may proceed on the basis of the correctness of that averment and include that averment amongst those upon which it determines whether the applicant is entitled to the final relief sought. So basically, if you look at the denials by the respondent and it, you, you feel that that does not give rise to a bona fide dispute and the respondent does not ask for a referral to oral evidence, then the court must then, um, and, and sorry, you must also be satisfied of the inherent credibility of what the applicant is saying what this simply means is that you must judge what the applicant is saying in the context, context of everything else in the affidavit and whether that, it, whether that is actually probable, considering, you know, uh, not only the facts that are there before the, before the court, but also um, what you understand about human relations and whatever else, you know, how things happen in life, etc. So is it inherently probable what the, the applicant is saying? And does the denial by the respondent not, not give rise to a genuine dispute? So the respondent might just deny the fact, 
It might just be a bare denial in the sense of he doesn't come forward and say, I deny what the applicant has said because this is actually what happened. He just denies and he puts the applicant to the proof. So the court must consider, does this give rise to a proper dispute? If I look at the surrounding facts, it is more probable that what the applicant has said has actually happened. So there is some credibility in what the applicant has said. And then the court will treat that as if it is an admitted fact and then decide the issues on the basis of that fact as well. All right, then where the relief that is being sought is interim. Maybe before I go to interim um, interdicts, just to go back to alternative remedy. So here what they say is that the alternative remedy must be a legal remedy, okay? and it must provide adequate and similar protection as the interim interdict would provide. So the answer, easy answer is usually, but you can claim damages, then the applicant must explain you know, why damages might be difficult to assess, because that is a possibility. Sometimes damages are simply difficult to assess. Some things are not capable of being remedied by damages. So um, to say that damages will be difficult to assess is something that often points to the fact that the person will not have an adequate remedy later on. Um, you may have also already exhausted alternative remedies that may have existed and they were not, you didn't succeed and that's why there will not be anything adequate later. And what they say is if your relief, your ultimate relief that you are seeking is vindicatory in nature and so you want interim relief pending a vindicatory or quasi-vindicatory action, so you intend to, to institute proceedings to reclaim an item which you are the owner of and is in possession, possession of somebody else, then you don't have to prove that you won't have uh, a, a other satisfactory remedy. That in those instances, is that last requirement is not necessary. Uh, that that you won't have an, uh, another adequate re remedy in due course. So you don't have to r prove a clear right. You can, but you don't have to. If you do prove a clear right just makes your life much easier for you to get an, get interim relief. But if it's not clear, it must be established prima facie, in the sense that it is open to some doubt, but there is something to be said for it. Another case that you can, a case that you can look at um, for for this is Webster versus Mitchell, is a 1948, volume one, SA, double one eight six. So this is a, just a quote from that case. The use of the phrase prima facie established, though open to some doubt, indicates, I think, that more is required than merely to look at the allegations of the applicant. But something short of a weighing up of the probabilities of conflicting versions is required. The proper manner of approach, I consider, is to take the facts as set out by the applicant, together with any facts set out by the respondent which the applicant cannot dispute, and to consider whether having regard to the inherent probabilities the applicant could on those facts obtain final relief at a trial. So then the court continues to say, the facts set up in contradiction by the respondent should then be considered. If serious doubt is thrown on the case of the applicant, he could not succeed in obtaining temporary relief for his right, prima facie established, may only be open to some doubt but if there is mere contradiction or unconvincing explanation, the matter should be left to trial and the right to be protected in the meanwhile, subject, of course, to the respective prejudice in the grant or refusal of interim relief. 
So if what the respondent says in response to applicants' allegations regarding the existence of the right casts serious doubt, then it's not prima facie established. But if it just gives rise to some contradictions between what the parties are saying, or it just simply makes the applicant's case slightly doubtful, then it's best for the issue of the determination of the existence of the right to be left to the trial. Because at this stage, you are not giving the, plain, the applicant final relief. All you are trying to do is to maintain, in most instances where interim relief is sought, to maintain the status quo, give the parties an opportunity, because in some cases, what would then afterwards follow is an action, as opposed to an application, but sometimes also an application. And in, that, in those proceedings, the court would then decide what are the rights of the parties. So all you are trying to do is to maintain uh, the status quo so that if finally the rights are determined, you don't sit with a situation where the applicant, although he maybe succeeds at the end of the day, he has now lost out because you have not maintained the status quo. So that's it. That's what, that's why you approach it in this way. So the person doesn't have to prove with absolute certainty that he has this right. So even if there's a, some, some doubt, it's okay. But if, it's, that if, that, if that doubt is serious or he hasn't established he hasn't given, the respondent has, has brought so many allegations which show that there is nothing, obviously, you can't be get given interim relief. Then you must go and try, take your chances in, in an action proceeding or an application that follows. Okay, then let's go back to the other requirements. So, you must also show that there is an apprehension of irreparable harm if the court doesn't protect you. So if you eventually establish your right and the court did not give you that interim relief, in essence, it would be academic in the sense that you would have then, by then, you would have suffered su irreparable harm, in the, uh, which, you know, the success of your case will not help you at the end of the day. So it's different from, from the final interdict in the sense that what you need to show with the, where you have a final interdict, when you are seeking a final interdict, is that you um, apprehend an injury, that an injury will be committed. Here you have to show that you apprehend that you will suffer irreparable harm if your interim relief is not granted. If you show you are looking for interim relief, if you show that your, you, if you show a clear right in an interim application, in, uh, an application for interim relief, then you don't have to prove that well-grounded apprehension of irreparable harm. You must simply show that they, that you um, apprehend that you will be caused harm. So you, you, you might suffer an injury, as is in the case with the final interdict. So the addition is that question of irreparable harm where, um, where you haven't established your right clearly. And it's, it makes sense because if the court is not sure that you have that right, then why should they give you the interim relief unless not giving you the interim relief might cause you irreparable damage? Because then the court can say, um, yeah, but even if, if the injury is committed, then you might still get something at the end of the day if you succeed in proving your right. So we're going to have lunch. It's uh, 12.30 now, and then we'll come back at 2. <laughs>